It's the rare person who gets to live out a personalized version of a Walter Mitty fantasy. <laughs> so here's my fantasy and then you see how we get to live it out. Um, it's my fantasy that I'm at a concert. You can uh, put in the names of your favorite artists. I'll say um, Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel Axe. Okay, how's that for a, uh, for a not bad group, right? And they, they give a wonderful concert. And then we applaud and we applaud them and they give an encore. And then we applaud and applaud and they give a second encore. And then we applaud and applaud and applaud and then uh, when the two of them concertize together, it's Yo-Yo Ma who speaks. Manny doesn't speak. No, it's always Yo-Yo Ma who speaks for the two of them. So he says, you're such a wonderful audience. We're just too tired. <laughs> we can't do a third encore, but I tell you what, well, we'll come back next month and we'll do a special program. <laughs> That's my Walter Mitty fantasy. <laughs> so here's the story. Uh, this is the second encore lecture. But happy to relate, between last week and today, I had a, a wonderful meeting with a wonderful man, and that is Wynne Lewis. And he told me that he'll be on sabbatical and would I come and preach and teach on June 23rd? So I'm turning to you because you, you are the stakeholders, right? <laughs> you know, ev everybody gets a vote, but I think that a person should get as many votes as the number of times that he or she has come. <laughs> so, so you have a, a, a passel of votes to give as to what you would like to learn that I have the capacity to teach as a standalone lesson on June 23rd. Obviously, I have a few ideas, but I encourage you to speak with Will, speak with the, the clergy, and um, just get some ideas back to me. And I'm more than happy to do my best to accommodate, uh, assuming, of course, that it's something that I can teach. Okay? June 23rd. I can already tell you what the sermon's gonna be about. Uh, to prepare for the sermon, I want you to listen to the Roberta Flack song, Killing Me Softly with His Words. But then I want you to imagine what would it be like if instead of killing me softly, it would be healing me softly with His Words. And with that in mind, I'd like you to read the chapter in the book of, Second, uh, of uh, First Kings, where Elijah, so depressed because Queen Jezebel wants to kill him, goes down to Mount Sinai, and it is not the thunder and not the lightning, <clears throat> not any of the violent manifestations of, of uh, nature, but the still small voice that becomes God's voice of message to him. So think about the Roberta Flack song, change the words to healing me, and then read that chapter in the Bible, then we'll be ready to go for June 20th. But that's not the teaching, that's the preaching. For teaching, I'm going to be relied upon relying upon your, your feedback. Is that, that fair? Okay, now, for today's uh, talk about Pirkei Avot, there's another song that I'd like you to call to mind. This song was written in 1931 in a little, a little tavern in Montclair, New Jersey, not far from where I grew up. And the song kind of languished for 11 years and then in 1942, the song became very, very popular because the actor who portrays Sam the piano player in the movie Casablanca sang the song. Now do you know what song I'm talking about? As Time Goes By, right? So consider one of his lines. The fundamentals still apply as time goes by. So with that in mind, we're going to be able to turn to our uh, in-depth look at the rabbinic wisdom collection, Pirkei Avot, the chapters of the founding fathers of rabbinic Judaism. Just to remind ourselves of where we stood historically, last week we looked at the history of the first two centuries of the common era, the Christian era in, in Jewish history. We saw that it was a time of tragedy and then near the end of it of 
reconstruction. The tragedy was the destruction of the Jerusalem temple by the Romans. And then two generations later, a very, very bloody suppression of another Jewish revolt, also by the Romans. The first was under the Emperor Vespasian and his son Titus, son and successor. Um, by the way, uh, I've never been able to connect with Mozart's opera, The Clemency of Titus. I never think of Titus and clemency in the same sentence. <laughs> He's the man who destroyed the temple. So when rabbis refer to Titus in the Talmud, his nickname is Titus, may his bones be ground into dust. <laughs> so just to let you know, that, that's how we remember this man. <laughs> Not one of our good friends. So it's not an exaggeration to say that psychologically, the Jews of the, uh, I'll, I'll take a copy too, thank you. Uh, of the era that saw the rise of the rabbis had experienced a Holocaust. We didn't in fact use the word Holocaust until the 1940s, but psychologically that's what it felt like. Uh, everyone was touched by the massive scale of, of murder. And moreover, the central institution of the religion had been destroyed. It wasn't simply a matter of rebuilding it elsewhere. You know, if, if you were to build a, a new Jerusalem in Salt Lake City or Boston, Massachusetts or any of the other places where they tried to build new Jerusalems, it wouldn't work. It's not like new Asgard in Norway, <laughs> right? Because old Jerusalem, according to Deuteronomy chapter 12, was the only place in the world where it would be permitted to offer the animal sacrifices. Because the Bible thought of those sacrifices as the way to repair the relationship with God, losing that temple means losing the unique way of repairing the relationship. And what happens, we, we have some people who are mental health professionals here. What happens when relationships lose their repair mechanisms, right? It's, it's not a happy end game. So there were any number of Jews who felt that Religiously, we are akin to the patient for whom dialysis is no longer an option. Spiritually, that's what's gonna be happening to us. And what made rabbinic Judaism um, speak to that generation, and what, what gave the rabbis the standing to become leaders of that generation was that they had an answer for this patient who felt that spiritually speaking, he was beyond the the uh, hope of dialysis. What the rabbi said is that a program that involves several um, deeds that are doable will replace the missing temple. The first of those is to democratize all of the commandments that we have in the Bible that we are able to democratize, such that not only Kohanim priests, but every Israelite would be capable of fulfilling them. So every Israelite, every Jew, we can now use the word Jew, every Jew and not only the priests would eat their meals in a condition of ritual purity, having washed their hands beforehand. Every community where there would be a, a rabbinic court and not only Jerusalem, would be a place where on the new year, you could hear the shofar sounded. Every place with the court, and not only Jerusalem, is where you could wave the palm and the citron on, on tabernacles, and so on. I do wanna tell you, since we're friends, the funniest autocorrect, I'm sure you all have a collection of funny autocorrect, palm, in Hebrew is lulav, L-U-L-A-V. Citron is etrog, E-T-R-O-G. 
my wife was sending me a text about lulavs, we each say lulavim, lulavs, and then she pluralized it in Hebrew, etrogim. In other words, would I bring the palm and the citron from the synagogue back to the house so we could use it in our, the booth that we build? And instead of lulavs and etrogim, what came through, thanks to, thanks to Professor Autocorrect, was lilacs and estrogen. <laughs> What a, what a beautiful image. <laughs> so now we know that God loves us. <laughs> so the, the genius of rabbinic Judaism was to decentralize and to democratize what had hitherto been a temple and priest centered religion so that it could still speak to everyone. But that first aspect of rabbinic um, coping with the destruction of the temple involved two other critical aspects and those two critical aspects show up over and over and over again in the book that we're studying today. The first is Talmud Torah, the study of God's Word. The formal, religious, regular, disciplined, community framed study of the Torah. Rabbinic study of Torah follows canons of interpretation. There are legitimate and there are illegitimate ways to uh, draw inferences from this text. Uh, these are basically uh, rational uh, agreements about what is a legitimate inference from the words of a text. It's done in a community setting. It's done in a traditional setting. The, the inferences from previous generations are passed along. That's tradition. They're received and they're passed along. And new inferences may be drawn if they follow the correct grammar of how one studies such a text. That's Talmud Torah. That's one of the other major rabbinic answers. And the second one is a life of holy fidelity to the commandments, which includes, in one instance, the commandment to go beyond the commandment. Christians understand this well. The commandment to live by loving kindness. It's hard to command loving kindness. Right? I could command you to buy roses every year on your anniversary. I could command you to present them. I could command you to write certain words on a note. It's hard to command you to feel what you've just written. That doesn't seem to be within the scope of humans to command. Nonetheless, the rabbis insist that this cultivation of loving kindness is one of the ways to heal when the world has been broken. So that, that's what accounts, looking at it from a uh, summary statement of, for the rabbinic emergence as authorities within Israel. Now we're going to look specifically at this book, Pirkei Avot. It has five chapters. There's a sixth one that was added later. But if we look at the chapters, not atomistically, if we look at them chapter by chapter, we see that there are a couple of overarching themes. The theme of the first two chapters is the chain of tradition. This is an idea which is familiar to us if we've studied the Hellenistic writings about philosophy. So-and-so was the disciple of so-and-so. He learned his philosophy at so-and-so's academy and his students were the following. We end up with chains of tradition in an intellectual sense. That's what you have in Pirkei Avot as well. Rabbi so-and-so received Torah from the preceding Rabbi so-and-so. And in turn, his disciples were thus and such. You have that notion of chain of tradition. Now, a chain needs to be supported at every link. So, and a critical question is, what's the first link of the chain? 
chain's not going to be stronger than its first link. So that's the radical claim with which the rabbis begin this book of Pirkei Avot. And I'll, I'll read the first paragraph for you in translation. Moses received Torah from God at Sinai. Well, that you know from the Bible, right? But you don't know what the rabbis mean by it yet. Again, Moses received Torah from God at Sinai. He transmitted it to Joshua. Joshua to the elders. The elders to the prophets. All this you can more or less glean from the first six books of the Hebrew Bible. The five books of Moses plus Joshua. But the text goes on. The prophets transmitted it to the members of the great assembly. Who were the members of the great assembly? They're not mentioned in the Bible. Already there's a claim of continuity between the Bible and the post-biblical period for Judaism. Again, Christians are familiar with this because you have a notion of apostolic succession. I don't know the answer to this, but probably someone in the room does know. Who was the Bishop of Rome after Peter? You could look it up, right? And so on and so on and so forth until the current Bishop of Rome, Francis, in an unbroken succession. So the notion of a chain of succession and the legitimacy of it being connected to the first link is, is familiar to us. These men of the great assembly, unlike the, the previous links, have their saying, their characteristic maxim quoted. So listen to their maxim. They formulated three precepts. By the way, they all get threes. This seems to be a, a principle of composition in the book. People get either threes or they get groups of threes. Be deliberate in rendering judgment. Don't judge hastily. Be deliberate in judgment. Raise up many students. Build a fence around the Torah. What they mean by that is um, don't let yourself get too close to a temptation which might sink you. Don't, um, don't trouble trouble. If you're not supposed to be doing business on the Sabbath, then don't go window shopping through um, MacArthur Mall. That's an example of you know, building a fence around the Torah. So the point I want to make, though, is that the three things that they remembered as having been said are not Bible quotes. They're maxims. I, I think they're good maxims. They're certainly good maxims for people who exercised both judicial and teaching functions, which is what rabbis did. Be deliberate in rendering judgment. Raise up many disciples. Good advice, but not traceable to any one sentence of the Bible. In, in harmony with the Bible, to be sure, but not a quote. That being so, let's go back to the beginning. Moses received Torah at Sinai. He gave it to A, A gave it to B, B gave it to C, C gave it to D, D, D gave it to E, and E said, and you have three precepts that are not quotes from the Bible. So now let's go back and understand what is this Torah that Moses is said to have received? And the answer is that according to the rabbis, Moses not only got the written text, he also got the oral instruction that goes with it. How many of you have tried to put together a, a cradle from Ikea or something like that? <laughs> okay, usually there are pictures, right? And then you have uh, some sentences, <laughs> charitably described as sentences. I think that some you know, Google translation program from Japanese to English is what's responsible for, for what you read. And you try to figure out what they're saying. Right? <coughs> but even if you could do that, 
you'd need knowledge that goes beyond the words themselves. You'd need to know what is the proper domain for using screwdrivers as opposed to hammers. Right? You wouldn't just get this from the words. In fact, no text will give you everything you need to understand that said text. That's a, a critical point of departure for the rabbis. So what about the text of the Bible? Is the Bible fully self-explanatory? It can't be because no text can be. So what of the traditions that surround the Bible? Are they just uh, a good guess or do they have some religious status? The rabbinic movement takes its first fundamental stand on the idea that the traditions of how to understand the words of the Bible are also part of revelation. They call that the oral Torah. I should tell you, since we're in an Episcopalian church, that Anglican thought is very much the same. You might remember the name Hooker from the late 1500s and the notion of how is a Christian to be guided? And he uses the famous example of a three-legged stool. Again, three. Three is a stable number. So for Hooker, there is the word, which is scripture. There is the religious tradition of how the faith community has understood that word from its inception until now. And then there's also the application of human reason. God gave you brains, it's not God's fault, it's your fault if you don't use them. So reason, tradition, and scripture, as distinct from the Lutheran um, sola scriptura, which is to say scripture and reason, but no tradition. Hooker and the Anglican church, in this case, I'm sure they disagree with Judaism about other things. <laughs> in this case, they agree with Judaism that tradition is part of the enterprise of understanding God's word. So that's the first rabbinic claim that when we read Torah uh, using a sanctioned methodology, a publicly challengeable methodology, our, our conclusions need to be falsifiable, and there, there are canons for doing that. Uh, and when our conclusions pass muster, the rabbinic claim is that too is part of the authority of Moses. So knowledge in a religious sense is cumulative, and the later inferences are also enjoying the nimbus of sanctity that the earlier texts have to. Basic rabbinic point. And that's how they start the treatise. The very next uh, paragraph sets out one of the basic programs of the book Pirkei Avot. One of the last surviving members of the Great Assembly. So this is someone who lived, let's say, 2200 years ago was a man named Shimon HaTzadik, Simon the Righteous. And his famous statement was, the world rests upon these three things, Torah, <coughs> worship, and deeds of love and kindness. Now Torah, we've already come to understand from the earlier paragraph, is God's word to us, including how we engage that word. The second one, avodah, specifically means the worship of God as was conducted in the temple, the sacrifices. The third is, as I mentioned before, deeds of love and kindness. So think about this in terms of arrows of direction. Torah is God engaging us. Worship is our engagement of God in return. And deeds of love and kindness is our engagement of each other. Makes a solid <coughs> triangle. That's what you need to have a stable world. You need to be receptive to God's teachings. You need to be in an ongoing human dialogue with God. And you need to reflect that 
in your love-driven responses to your neighbors. I think, I think we could pause at this point and come to a ready recognition that there's a certain, um, certain trope of uh, anti-Jewish argumentation that, oh, you Jews are all about law and not, not at all about love. If you actually take the time to look at fundamental Jewish texts, you see they're not describing the actual Jewish religion. So be aware of that. A little bit later, I'm going to talk about how, in Jewish eyes, law can be an expression of love. But for, for now, I want us to see the point that to criticize Judaism as a loveless religion is simply not true to what is being studied. Now, times go on. The temple's destroyed. And I want us to hear a later Rabbi Simon, who went back over the same ground and came up with a very different answer. So the, the first chapter ends with another Rabbi Simon saying the world rests upon three things, on law, on peace, and on truth. And when you, when you mess with one of those, you end up losing the other two as well, which without excessive editorializing, we can see is connected to the contemporary crisis that our country finds itself in. Law, peace, and truth, all intimately interconnected. Now, nobody likes mommy and daddy to disagree. So there are many, many commentators in the book, to the book of Pirkei Avot who try to correlate the second Rabbi Simon statement with the first Rabbi Simon statement. And that's well and good, and they make a lot of interesting and important and cogent points. However, I want us to see precisely how those two statements are not the same, not how they are able to be harmonized. The first Rabbi Simon has temple sacrifices, and the second Rabbi Simon does not. The reason for that is that the temple had been destroyed. So the second Rabbi Simon, you should understand, is speaking to his generation. You could even say he's speaking therapeutically or pastorally to them. Because the first Rabbi Simon's statements were, were revered, were collected, were known. I can hear someone hurling them as a challenge to the second Rabbi Simon. Rabbi Simon, you know a world needs at least three things to rest on, otherwise it tips over. And we no longer have one of those three pillars. So how can we survive? How indeed? So Rabbi Simon takes up the challenge of formulating what are the basic underpinnings of civilized life without a temple. So if we step back and look at the entire first chapter of the Pirkei Avot treatise, we see that it contains a journey from Judaism with a temple to Judaism without a temple. But as Sam sang, the fundamentals still apply. With the temple, without the temple, they still have Torah. They still have God. They still have the mandate to live holy lives and lives of love. They still have the mandate to seek peace and pursue it. They still have the mandate to honor the truth which in the rabbinic uh, image, you know how everyone back then had a signet ring, at least everyone important did, and that's how you signed your name? So if, according to the rabbinic image, truth is what's written on God's signet ring. When God signs and seals in wax a given document, the seal says truth. You like that? I like that. Please. I'm sorry? Uh, your question says something to, to me that we share in our 21st century discourse, which we need to translate in order for the first century rabbis to hear that question. Because they felt that they were faithful custodians of true teaching. You and I live in a, an age where pluralism uh, 
uh, has acquired a new legitimacy. And being children of our age, we would say that's a good thing too. But uh, I will acknowledge that while they were very humane, they were mostly focused on their national survival when the odds were against them. Let me turn to the second chapter. When you have uh, competing branches of government, I don't want to be accused of being relevant. <laughs> <laughs> there is the possibility of tension between those branches. No? <laughs> yes. So there were two kinds of rabbis after the temple. There was the Roman sanctioned rabbis and there was the others. The Romans, when they were ruled by pagan Roman emperors, had a practice of insisting that uh, what needed to be rendered unto Caesar would be rendered unto Caesar, but they weren't excessively worried about the internal self-governance of their subject peoples. If you're a citizen of Rome, then you have the Roman laws. If you're not a citizen of Rome, if you're part of a, another group that the Roman Empire has taken over, then the Romans were content for you to have an ethnarch, okay, a ruler of your ethnos. So the Romans had that principle in mind when they appointed a rabbi as a chief rabbi. And they used the word patriarch. And in Hebrew it's nasi, which could mean patriarch or could mean prince. So the Romans had a dynasty of patriarchs and those rabbinic patriarchs had their chanceries, they had scribes, they had a bureaucracy, they ran courts, they, they did a lot of the work of the internal self-government of the Jewish community. And the Romans felt that that was an efficient way to rule over another group of people. They didn't have to do all the, the uh, micromanagement work of administration. They just collected the profits. You wonder how the Roman Empire lasted so well. <laughs> they, 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 were, they were good at that. So the patriarchate, uh, by the way, one of the patriarchs is known to you from the book of Acts in the New Testament. Do you remember in the New Testament there's a, there's a Jewish figure named Gamaliel? Gamaliel? Gam, in chapter 5 of the book of Acts. You should go home and look it up. I think it's, I'm not sure, I think it's chapter 5 verse 34. I might be wrong, but I might be right too. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in Hebrew we have this Rabban Gamaliel, lived around the year 100. Now there was more than one Gamaliel because it was one of these dynastic names. When, whenever we see a Gamaliel, we don't know if it was the grandfather or the grandson or the great-great-grandson because it's a name which kept on coming back. So maybe the Gamaliel I'm thinking about is the grandson of the Gamaliel that I, I just cited. The rabbis called him Rabban, which means our rabbi, which is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's very flattering. You are our chief. On the other hand, you are our chief rabbi, which means you're still constrained by the code of conduct that constrains a rabbi. In fact, the rabbis impeached Rabbi Gamliel, and they deposed him at one point because he was too rude and crude to some of his leading colleagues. They felt that's not modeling the love and kindness, which is a pillar of the world. And they deposed him. After he performed an act of repentance, they brought him back so that he was um, granted the honor of being the, the rabbi of the rabbinic synagogue three weeks out of four. And the fellow who had been put in in his stead continued to have it one week out of four. It's interesting that we have an impeachment and deposition of a chief rabbi in the Talmud. Interesting. Now, 
we have the statements of Rabban Gamaliel, we have the statements of his sons who were the ongoing patriarchs. And then chapter two goes back to the beginning again and it gives us the statements of a rabbi named Yohanan ben Zakai. Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai is the George Washington in a sense of rabbinic Judaism. He is the rabbi who is said to have fled the besieged city of Jerusalem, to have made peace with the Romans and to have been allowed to go to a city far from the fighting and to reconstitute the Sanhedrin, the, the high Jewish academy, which is also a high court. So now we have two potentially adversarial structures. We have the structure of the patriarchate authorized by Rome. We have the establishment church, if you will. And then we have the spiritual or intellectual aristocracy, rabbis of the one, rabbis of the other. So there's potential for tension there. But in this chapter, the tension is shown to have been resolved by the work of one of the patriarchs, Rabbi Judah, the patriarch, who is in fact the compiler of the entire Mishnah. Rabbi Judah had the unreserved uh, respect of the rabbinic movement and he was the patriarch. He lived at a time when the Jewish people had attempted two revolts in the land of Israel with disastrous consequences. But the Romans also were ready to try to rule with a, a somewhat lighter hand instead of having to call in legion after legion. It's very expensive to suppress revolts. And think about it, if you got the Roman budget to worry about, wouldn't you rather they lived in peace and paid their taxes? Your net is much greater at that point. So Rabbi Judah and the, the new dynasty of Roman emperors uh, were able to create a better modus vivendi. And Rabbi Judah in that time of relative peace and quiet edited this book called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a digest of Jewish laws. It contains many, many laws that were not capable of being fulfilled in those days. It contains many, many laws about the temple of Jerusalem, how the sacrifices were prepared, how they were offered, the conditions of ritual purity that applied only to the temple precincts, and so on and so forth. Why would Rabbi Judah put all of that material into his digest of Jewish law? Because he wanted to make a point. We are not able to fulfill those commandments. So what should we do? Should we rise up in revolt so that we can rebuild our temple and fulfill those commandments? That had been tried and had failed with horrible consequences. Rabbi Judah's point, which is the rabbinic point, is political quietism can be a strategy. God will send the Messiah when God will send the Messiah. You don't have to spend too much time trying to force God's hand. There's enough for you to do right now. You have to live a good life, you have to live a religious life, you have to live a holy life, you have to live a loving life, and that can take up all of your, your, your efforts. As for being able to fulfill these commands, every single day you should pray to God for the restoration of Zion, and every single day you should work some study time in, including the study of what the ideal future will look like. So the very impracticality of about a third of the entire Mishnah is part of the sublimation of the messianic impulse in Judaism, which had proved to be suicidal twice in a row in the generations leading up to Rabbi Judah. Now, I've gotten a little bit ahead of the story because chapter two of Pirkei Avot gets ahead of the story. Chapter three and chapter four double back and look at the statements of the rabbis who lived during this period of time bracketed by those two terrible revolts against the Romans, terrible in, in their consequences. The leading rabbi of those generations is a man named Akiba, son of Joseph. Rabbi Akiva is probably the uh, 
one of the two or three brightest lights of the entire constellation of, of rabbinic Judaism. It's probably Rabbi Akiva who started the systematizing work which ultimately resulted in Rabbi Judah's Mishnah. Now, of all the many wonderful things that Rabbi Akiva was remembered to have said, I want to focus on one which is in the middle of chapter three of Pirkei Avot. Rabbi Akiva said, Humans are beloved, for they were created in the image of God. They are exceedingly beloved, for it was no, made known to them that they were created in the divine image. As it is written, in the image of God were mortals made, Genesis chapter nine. Israel is beloved, for they are called God's children. They are exceedingly beloved, for it was made known to them that they are God's children. As it is written, Deuteronomy chapter 14, you are children of the Lord your God. Let's, let's understand that statement in its historical context. He's living in a ruined age. He's living at a time that the yoke of the Romans was so heavy that it drove the people to suicidal acts of rebellion. He himself would ultimately lose his life in a, in a horribly cruel way. He was tortured to death by the Romans. So Rabbi Akiva is telling his colleagues, he's telling his congregation, you've seen the worst that humans do, far worse to each other than any wolf ever has been. And yet, they're beloved. Don't give up on the soul possibilities of the human. Don't give up on it. It's a statement of hope despite the evidence of human ugliness. And then he says, not only are we beloved, but even more so, we know that we're beloved. How do we know that we're beloved? He quotes the Bible which is always the, the go-to constitutional text for them. Then he makes another claim, which must seem oh so startling. Israel is beloved, God loves Israel. Well, let's see now, we're living as slaves in our own land, our temples destroyed, the Romans are horrible, God loves us. How, how do you get that, Rabbi Akiva? He says, even so, God loves you. And the proof is God calls you his children. And it's in the Bible. God loves me, this I know, because my Bible tells me so. <laughs> Akiba could have written that. <laughs> you, you know the Christian version of that. So that is what I wanted to tell you about Rabbi Akiva. Now, for all of that sermonizing, sometimes the mind rebels. So the statements of the rabbis who, whose time period bracketed these wars are found in chapter three and chapter four. I want to try to make sense of the last chapter, chapter five, while we still have a few minutes. Chapter five is about numbers. Remember Sesame Street? This episode is brought to you by the number 10, remember that? <laughs> so chapter five is about the significant tens in the world, the significant sevens, the significant fours, the significant threes. I'll, I'll, I'll just read a little touch of it so that you get a sense of it. 10 things were created on the eve of the Sabbath of creation. Think about this, it doesn't say that in the Bible. In the Bible it says, God looked at everything he'd made, it was very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. God finished up rested on the seventh day and hallowed it. So there's nothing in between Genesis 1.31 and Genesis 2.1 which tells you about God's creative work in the last nanosecond before the sun set. <laughs> the rabbis come up with 10 things. Let me read you the list then we'll figure out why these 10 are there. The mouth of the earth, 
that swallowed up Korach. Remember the, the Korach rebellion? It gets transferred to Dathan in the, in the Cecil B. DeMille movie. But remember the earth swallows them up? That was created on the eve of the first Sabbath. The mouth of the well. This is a rabbinic legend that there was a well that followed the Israelites everywhere they went in the desert until Miriam died because it was really in tribute to her. When she died, suddenly they were thirsty. <laughs> so think about all the, since it's almost Mother's Day, think about all the unsung women who are the wells for their family and they don't even get credit for it. But when they're not in the picture, the family goes thirsty. Can you relate to such women? The mouth of the donkey. This is the story of Bilam and the talking donkey. The rainbow at the end of the flood story. The manna, etc., etc. There are 10 vignettes, 10 elements of biblical stories, all of which would be thought of as miraculous. The rabbis are saying, we have a different notion of the miraculous. The miraculous is the highly unusual, but not utterly against God's providence of the world in natural terms. The miraculous is these exceptional moments that God wove into the fabric of the natural law of creation against the day than they would be needed. So here you see the rabbis beginning to come to grips with Greek science. They're trying to accommodate a pre-philosophical document, which is the Torah, with the notion of God is the author of the laws of nature, which they inherited from, from the Greeks. But notice that it's 10. And there are other 10s. There were 10 times our ancestors tested God's patience in the wilderness, etc. 10 miracles were performed for our ancestors in the temple. Our father Abraham withstood 10 tests, and so on and so forth. What's the point of all these numbers? I'd like to read the answer to that question given by a very fine contemporary rabbinic scholar, Professor Jacob Neusner. Neusner wrote, what is gained by the making of lists? Our sages of the second and third centuries confronted a world of chaos and disorder. The old regularities faded. The established certainties lost all credibility. The familiar way of organizing the world led to destruction. The reliable patterns were shattered. For the sages, the work of making a list of things represents in intellectual form the larger task of the age. It is meant to show that beneath chaos, order yet endures. Patterns can be found. Isolated facts can be drawn together, classified, shown to bear meaning. This work of the mind served a social purpose. In the life of the mind, the sages lived out the dilemma of their day and solved it. By making lists, by thinking in the orderly way in which the Mishnah's masters pursue thought, we master and make sense of whatever is to be known. So there's something almost existentialist in this. The world threatens to be meaningless. We have a faith that it's not, but we need to contribute our efforts to reveal the meaningfulness that is only inherently there. The closing words of the Ethics of the Fathers, Pirkei Avot, there are, are, are two very short maxims which I read together. The first one is a programmatic statement about the Bible. It says, turn it, turn it over and turn it over because you will find everything in it. The rabbi who is almost, we know almost nothing about him. He has a rather strange name. His name is the son of Bagbag. <laughs> we really don't know much about it. I wonder what his grandmother was thinking when she named his father Bagbag. <laughs> He's saying the Torah is a classic. The definition of a classic is a work which speaks to future ages, not only its own age. The Torah is a classic that will get us through even the wreckage of the world we live in now. 
And the next rabbi, who also has an odd name, his name is the son of Hey Hey. Go figure that out. <laughs> I, I can tell you 20 theories, but none of them are persuasive. If they were persuasive, it would be only one. <laughs> son of Hey Hey, what he says is quite memorable. No pain, no gain. He's the author of that. According to the painstaking, so will be the reward. If you want to dig and delve in the mines of wisdom, prepare to be giving your best efforts for your whole life. You're not going to get wise on the cheap. But I think we know that by now. <laughs> I think we know that nothing is easy in this world, but there is a reward. I think we've learned in the course of our semester what we hopefully already somewhat knew beforehand, that the effect on the individual, on you and on me, of devoting one's life to seeking God's guidance and of living by it, the effect is in the nobility and the meaningfulness of that life. And that is our reward. Thank you so much for your attentiveness.